Patriots. Welcome to Hope for Survival YouTube. And we have the honor today of being with uh, special guest author John Deslin and um, promoting John and his book, as well as spending time uh, with this great patriot. John, welcome to Hope for Survival. Tell us a little bit about Nehemiah Strong. Uh, well, Bravo Echo, thank you for having me, sir. Yes. Uh, Hello, everybody, fellow patriots and believers. My name is John Dislin, and uh, I'm the author of Nehemiah Strong. Uh, it was a nearly two-year effort, and uh, I think what came out uh, is uh, effectively a field manual to equip uh, patriot believers to stand, occupy, and overcome in this uh, season of trial. It's about a 480-page, 8.5 by 11, uh, really reference guide. And it's chock full of uh, spiritual related matters, but also practical applications um, to deal with a really broad spectrum of challenges in this uh, in this season. Also, it has 48 practical application um, essential supplements and exhibits in the back uh, covering everything from, you know, self-defense, home defense, countermeasures against home invasion to medical related and uh, and a lot of spiritual um, resources you won't find anywhere else. Um, you can find all this stuff at my website, johndislin.com, and Dislin is spelled D-Y-S-L-I-N, so johndislin.com. And for those um, valued followers of Bravo Echo and his friend Festus, um, there's a special 10% discount code, HFS1 for you guys to save 10%. So thank you in advance for your interest and your time and um, look forward to seeing you over at johndislin.com. Hey, fellow patriots, welcome to Hope for Survival YouTube. And this is part two in the Nehemiah Strong series. And today we will be discussing spiritual warfare toolkit applications with the author of Nehemiah Strong, Mr. John Deslin and Mr. Festus himself um, was able to join us again. And I uh, thank everyone for uh, your watching and reviews of uh, part one last week. Um, I had very favorable comments and uh, input. So um, gentlemen, welcome. And uh, you ready to roll? We'll get started. Absolutely. Um, well, glad to have you back again this week. Thank you very much. Good to be back. So, John, when we're talking spiritual warfare, um, as discussed in Nehemiah Strong, you talk about spiritual warfare, uh, it can be direct or indirect. Can you elaborate for the uh, viewers um, a little bit, maybe with an example to, to help them out on that? Absolutely. And, um, you know, th that may not have been the best word choice. You know, when I think about direct and indirect, I'm thinking more of what might have been a better word choice would be uh, overt and covert. Sure. Okay. So uh, so overt <laughs> would be when uh, everybody in the room who's paying attention and, and has a modicum of spiritual discernment would say, holy smokes, there's something really not right going on with that person. And um, so, for example, it, 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 it's, it's a more overt manifestation where that demonic influence is, uh, is a lot more present, more open, more uh, obvious, and more, um, frankly, more aggressive and uh, engaged or engaging. Okay. So for example, uh, <laughs> I think I may have talked about this, uh, the, the, our prior discussion, but I was in a setting a few months back with someone, um, I know from my childhood, uh, who has, uh, had a hard road, uh, relationally and not with me, but, but with somebody else. And, um, where, in my considered opinion, that there's been really powerful demonic infusion and um, uh, influence 
cast into this person's life. And uh, I was with this person a few months ago for the first time in many years. And, uh, and the, everything about this person was radically altered, I'll say, okay, from this person's uh, demeanor, their appearance, their hair color, their, um, their behavior, their uh, idiosyncrasies, their tics, their just the, the way they spoke, um, their uh, sort of relational or emotional posture, everything was uh, real, real, real different and not just different, but, but off. And, um, and I knew, I, I suspected it would be a version of this going in because of the history that I knew of that had been happening in my absence over these many years. And, um, <laughs> what's fascinating is this, this person walked into the room and, and, uh, and, and the entire climate of the room shifted and this person, uh, engaged in a really aggressive one, one of my experience that I, I think is has a lot of consistency. I'm not going to say it's universal, but a lot of consistency is a from a from a demonic perspective is uh, an over aggressive posture. You know, it's it's like the demons the demons don't know how to get along, mm -hmm. right? They don't know how to work and play well with others because they're demons. And so this person comes in, the whole climate of the room changes. This person basically commandeers the room, commandeers this um, activity of why we were together, and they uh, and they just basically take over in a real um, counter relational, aggressive, um, kind of frankly, kind of troubling way. Um, and but I'll tell you something else that's that's interesting is that uh, that this person would not look me in the eye. Um, they would not look me in the eye the entire time we were together, maybe forty minutes, something like that. And so, um, and and given my my walk with the Lord and my experience with you know the demonic, you know the demonic know a thing or two. I mean, they're I think they're limited and they're they're troubled and they're scared of Christians and all that kind of stuff, but they, they know how the cow ate the cabbage from the standpoint of spiritual warfare, more so than I'm embarrassed yeah. to say nine, 995 out of a thousand Christians, which is why they were in circles around us. Um, Very perceptive. Well, but, uh, but this person would not look, would not engage with me. And I, I came prepared to fight, but as I ultimately had decided going into this situation, um, you know, it was Jesus who said, be, was it Jesus who said, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves? Or was that James? I think it may have been James. Was it in any event, I decided to go in and be harmless as a dove. And, and if things took off, then I was ready, but I decided not to create a windswept house, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but I was ready for it. But what's it, I was really fascinated that that this person would not look me in the eye the whole time. Um, so anyway, I to me that's kind of a let's say a more garden variety, less dramatic example of an overt um, uh, manifestation of the demonic. I think more covert. I think you get into things like developing addictions, I think is a good example of a more covert, um, where it's less of a, let's say, oppression or possession, and it's more so of an influence or sort of leaning you down the broad way that, you know, leads to the wide gate that leads to destruction. And so let's say a, a developing uh, habit with, let's say, online pornography. Or let's say you go from, you know, drinking a beer with buddies every once in a while till you start having two or three every night. I think I really think that demonic activity is much more pervasive than we give it credit for, because I think it can start subtly and slowly and gradually to the point where the, the pot for the frog is, is being turned up slowly. Um, I think not so much 
because that's the way the demons want it. Because I, and I'll talk about that in a second. But I think I think there are hedges of protection that God provides, particularly for His children, where you, in many situations, you are, you know, overwhelmed by evil and sin by degrees and God gives you out and he gives you out and he gives you off lanes and he gives you, you know, he gives you all these opportunities to, to turn away. Right. Which is the whole, the whole meaning of repentance, you know, in the Greek, it means to turn away as if you're, you're on, on a boat and you're about to hit the rock and you, you know, the guy in the front of the bow screams, repent, 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 yeah. because you're going to hit the rock. Um, so I think that's an element of grace that God gives us that it's, Usually it's not all at once. Usually it's gradual. Um, but I, I think the demonic is all is is riddled within every addiction you could you could name. And and I'm including things like um, uh, addictions to sports teams, addictions to um, to to liking things too much. And that you know I I. Uh, I grew up in East Tennessee and, uh, you know, when you grow up in Tennessee, you just, your opportunity to try smokeless tobacco products is, uh, is pretty, uh, rampant. Sure. And so, sure. you know, I wound up chewing tobacco when I was a teenager and, and got hooked on the stuff for 35 years. <laughs> and, and I'm utterly convinced that, that things like even something is seemingly sort of benign as, as chewing tobacco you know, it sucks you in, it, it, it sets the hook and then, you know, good luck getting off of that thing. And I'll tell you the, the only thing that got me to stop chewing tobacco was, um, was, uh, frankly being born again. And I, I've, after that, I've never done it since, but, um, but I, I think the demonic work very often through every, every point on the spectrum of addiction you can think of, because I think addiction is, a symptom of the demonic because that's the nature of the appetite of demons. I think they have an insatiable appetite for corruption and destruction. And so if you if you've got any kind of addiction, you know, even like, let's say a food addiction or uh, I mean, it, it, I don't know, this might be too far, but maybe even an exercise addiction, you're addi addicted to the endorphins, any, anything that's out of the norm, unnatural, has destructive qualities, can lead you down that path, and has that insatiable appetite. I I, I smell the demons uh, close by to 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 any of those things. So I've watched over the, and you probably have noticed as well. I know Festus has over the last few years with everything going on nationally. Um, and I've even written some on this topic <laughs> as well as spoken. You were talking about addictions to sports teams. Mm. We, we we have witnessed, especially amongst believers, Christians, what seems like an addiction to our former president mm. and putting so much faith that he was going to come out of the magic hat, you know, and appear back in the White House. Whatever mm. one may believe, that's not my point, but uh instead of putting their faith in a positive outcome here they are putting it on another human yeah right and they're trusting in a system that they may or may not understand versus putting the the problem or concern or fear where it should be yeah so in a way you could take that a step further and say people are kind of addicted to a certain pastor or personality type pastor uh, with a yeah. certain theology, you know, from the pulpit, uh, feel good, et cetera, et cetera. It could be the same way, although the Trump thing is, is much more easily recognizable, probably. Yeah. But, you know, Festus, that's a great point. And think of where that leads to. Think of think of just sticking on that point a minute of a, of a pastor and yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll call it a leader, like a religious leader. Um, it might start benign enough, maybe, <laughs> you know, seemingly. Um, but ultimately that's how cults get started. 
And that's how, you know, Jim Jones was able to kill 900 some odd people down in Guyana was it becomes a cult of personality. And then that person becomes the center of reverence instead of reverence being directed to an almighty God. And so it's, we're, you know, I, there's that phrase from scripture where it says we're beset on all sides. We, we are beset on all sides. It's true. And so uh, we, I, I think Satan covets worship. I think that's why in Revelation is it chapter 13 where, you know, all are forced to, to worship and take the mark of the beast and to worship his image and uh, et cetera. So he covets the worship, but he'll settle for, you know, if, if you get off track in any direction, so long as you're off track, that's a good start. And um, so our, <laughs> you know, I think, I think, it's clear to any thinking person that we were built to worship. You know, you, you go to the deepest jungles and they're worshiping something. And, but it's, it's, it's crucial that we know that we know God. And I'll tell you something else that I think is really important is that we worship the right Jesus, because there are a lot of false Jesuses out there that are based on false doctrine um, where somebody says, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, I follow Jesus. Well, you better be following the Jesus of the Bible, because if you're following a construct Jesus who, you know, only pretends to have his name and otherwise isn't isn't the real McCoy, you could have a real bad day come judgment time. Yeah. So um, for, for individuals, people who uh, believe they've... Uh, encountered evil spirits or, or demonic powers how how should they how should they then pray or if i'm if i'm talking to you two brothers and i said i i really need your prayers and here's why and i'm asking for your prayer how should that end up how would you suggest an individual pray or ask for prayer in this, in this, in the spiritual warfare arena. Um, that, I think that's a really crucial point and I'm going to take it in a direction you weren't expecting, but, but you led me there. So I'm going to take the fork in the yes. road, so to speak, Go for uh, it. as Joe Guerra once put it right, you take the fork. Um, and, and frankly, I think, as I wrote Nehemiah Strong, I, I learned so much as I really dug into these spiritual issues and, and no more so than on spiritual warfare. Uh, and, and even though I'd traveled for several years with Russ Dizdar doing, you know, counter human trafficking and uh, counter satanic ritual abuse work with him and his SIIU team, um, I, it really opened my eyes, you know, because when you write something, you, you really dig into it even more so than reading it. And uh, something that is really simple on its face, but I think is incredibly profound for believers to, to understand and know is that there, there are things that we are meant to pray for and there are things that we are meant to do. And, and for those things that we're meant to do, we're expected to understand that we are to do those things ourselves. And I'll give you an analogy. You know, when um, I've got a couple of teenagers and when they were, you know, three or four years old and we got them ice cream, you know, I, I would help making sure they didn't drop the ice cream and you got the napkins and, you know, they're not getting it all over the upholstery or wh whatever it might be, right? You, you got to tend to a little tiny child like that. Well, now <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're driving, you know, 6,000 pound vehicles on public roads to school every morning. Mm. And, uh, and I'm not worried about the ice cream anymore. And, and it's yeah. high time that we as believers stop needing our father to tend to us with the ice cream. We need to be out on the highways and byways and, and be capable and be fit for battle, fit for purpose. 
I say all that as a prelude to say, uh, and I'll, I'll reference something we did prior to the to the show, Bravo Echo, here in a second. There are things that your father expects you to pray for, and there are things that your father expects you to do. It, as his adopted son or daughter, knowing who you were saved by, knowing your authority that he has given you, okay? So, you know, you need providence, you need peace, you need uh, forgiveness for repentance, for, you know, doing whatever you did yesterday, um, all those things. Yes, pray, absolutely pray. And that's, if you don't have a healthy prayer life, um, you need to get one <laughs> quickly. Um, and then there are those things that you are to speak. You are to speak um, with the authority that God has given you. And, and that's, to me, that's one of the most profound uh, sections of the spiritual warfare toolkit section of the book is, or actually the, the, uh, the spiritual authority section, which is distinct from the, the warfare section. We have this astounding um, authority in his name. And so, for example, when Paul says in Romans 16, 20, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. He's not kidding, and he's not speaking hyperbolically. We are to crush Satan under our feet. Now, I do think there's kind of a, a total victory moment in Revelation 19 that we are participators in, right? But between here and there, God expects us to exercise that authority as his adopted children today. We don't have to, we don't have to keep asking for something he's already given us. And, and he's not looking for us to ask him to handle something that we should be fully equipped to handle. And so, for example, let's say, well, we, you know, we know somebody who has a, a an afflictive uh, matter going on in their marriage right now. Um, there is authority there that can be spoken into this situation that um, that is available that we're expected to move in, and that there are ways to move in that the demons, first of all, they don't want us to know it, but they, they, they have no, they have no recourse to our authority. Our authority is astoundingly, toweringly final as it pertains to spiritual warfare with demons, fallen angels, half breeds, you know, all, all the, all the, all the pantheon of the demonic we're number one under Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and his Father. And so long as we move in that authority in a right manner, we're expected to do that. So, so in response to your question, don't ask them to pray. Maybe ask them to speak the authority with you. And then, you know, maybe we talk about how you do that. Practical application. Application. But, Speak that authority in Jesus' name at, at, at these filthy demonic vermin that were never even meant to exist. Have no, they have no, uh, no avenue to redemption. There, there is no redemption for that. You, you don't have to, you don't have to pray for those enemies, right? Pray for your human enemies. You can, you can get down and dirty with the demonic vermin that are frankly infiltrating this place and uh, speak truth to power and command them in the name of your Savior, Jesus, and get them the hell out of your wives, your friends, your kids, your life, your house, your habits, your mind, and, and get to it. Do you think that... Uh, I can't say what percentage, but through conversation, I, I, I tend to believe there are individuals who either, for whatever reason, um, they do not know or they do not know how to exhibit those 
individual authorities. Yeah. Well, virtually nobody does. And, yeah. and that's that's why I think the book yeah. is pretty useful. And I'll tell you, I, I can't remember if we talked about this before, but um, I'd written a book. You know, it wasn't this final version, but I'd written a book last fall. And uh, and I, I shared it with a handful of people. And I went back through and, and reading your own book is, is kind of a hard slog. But anyway, I was reading my own book and just thinking like, editing and it was out of order in the introduction because the book I wrote was so dramatically different from what I planned that the, the introduction was crap. I had to throw it out and rewrite it. But uh, anyway, I'm in the midst of, of reading this thing. And uh, and it's really kind of funny. God was really sweet in the way he did it. He, it was almost as if he sort of tapped me on his shoulder and, and looked at me with kind of an incredulous look in his face and, and basically laid on my spirit that I danced all around spiritual warfare, but I never, I did, I never nailed it in that first draft. And so I had to go back and write the spiritual warfare toolkit section. And now it's 37 pages long. I think it's the longest section in the book and it's an A to Z as best as I know how to deliver with my feeble trammeled, you know, aging memory, uh, of just how to get after it. But I mean, to your point, I, I bet it's less than one in a hundred Christians even understands their authority, let alone knows how to wield it. And so maybe we should spend the balance of, of, uh, of this session talking about the ABCs. And just so even if you don't buy the book, you've got some building blocks to yeah. work with. Take off. Okay. Well, uh, and I think we Sounds spoke just a little bit. What's that? Sounds good. Okay. I think we spoke to this a little bit in the first session, but there's some prerequisites. You know, if you're following a false Jesus, if you're if you're not in a right walk with the Lord, you know, we we one of my teenagers, I think, had a bit of an epiphany in church Sunday where uh, the teaching was on Titus, but what came out was that if Jesus isn't the Lord of your life, he ain't your savior because you don't get the Chinese buffet, you know, Christianity experience. You don't get to take the Tim song and, you know, leave the noodles. You, you've, you, you got to take all of him or you get none of him. Yeah. And particularly when it pertains to Lord and savior, you don't get the savior part and not accept the Lord part. And, and so for, for one of my teenagers, it was really kind of an eye-opening moment uh, where they said, you know, wow, that's, now they get it, you know? And so you need to get it. If he's your savior and not your Lord, he's not your savior yet because you haven't accepted him as Lord. So they're, they're prerequisites. And, and I think a great example of that, um, Bravo Echo is, where is in, uh, I think it's Acts chapter 19 or 20, where um, the seven sons of the Sceva, and they're out pretending to be powerful. And then they encounter a, a truly demonized person. And that person says, Paul, I know, and Jesus, I know, but who are you? And then the demon through that person proceeds to tear them to pieces, stripped and naked. And they go, seven brothers go running down the street howling uh, because they were exposed. So, so that's kind of the first important part of prerequisite. You got to be walking with the Lord. You got to have a healthy prayer life. You got, you can't be in this repetitive sin. You can't be practicing this idol worship through, you know, through whatever your habits might be. You got to break that off. Um, all that good stuff. Okay. So prerequisites, you've got to have an authentic, walk with the Lord. And that's, you know, <laughs> we shouldn't just brush over that, but we need to get to the practical yeah. points. But that's, without that, you might as well turn off this recording because the rest of it doesn't apply to you. It's not available to you. So um, I, I think then a crucial layer after that is you have to, you have to have the discernment of the sons of Issachar. You have to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. You know, and, and I speak of um, Sons of Issachar, I think it's from First Chronicles uh, 
11 or 12, verse 32, it's, it's talking about the, the, the um, 12 tribes and who goes and, and said for the sons of Issachar who had understanding that they might know what to do in that situation of the 200 captains, all of them joined David's army. And, and so you've got to be, you've got to have the discernment to understand that we're on a battlefield and there is a war raging effectively for our souls. This war has gone on since Adam and Eve and the fall, and it, it's raging today. And you need to have eyes to see that that's going on. Okay. So I'd say the next layer is discernment. Okay. And the discernment of, of the battlefield, but then you've got to have situational discernment. For example, that event that I went to where this person from my childhood was there and <laughs> it was not right. And, uh, you know, yeah, I think it was pretty obvious to most everybody in the room, but frankly, it wasn't wasn't obvious to this person's family. They they've been around it so much. I don't think they could see this this drastic, drastically changed person. So anyway, you gotta have you gotta see the battlefield. You have to have discernment in individual situations, you know, um, trying to pick up on uh, a person's tells. Um, and so, for example, what do their eyes look like? You know, I, I think the eyes are the windows to the soul. I think there's real truth to that. Um, are they are they wild eyed? Are they wide eyed? Um, does it look like something else is looking out their eyes and not them? As, as strange as that sounds, some people's eyes you can look at and you're you're wondering what's looking out of those yeah. eyes, or maybe you're not. So. Um, do behaviorally, do they, do they behave with peculiar mannerisms? And I'm, I'm tr you know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to speak to every situation, but I'm just sharing some distinctions that I've noticed in my travels. You know, do they have peculiarities that seem beyond the norm? And, and I'm not talking about people who are a little quirky. I'm talking about people who's, who seem to have uh, almost unhuman mannerisms, habits. I, I also do believe, um, with all due respect to anyone watching, because it's, you know, we're, we're, we're all unfinished products, right? We're all hopefully working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, and if you are saved, you're, you're still being uh, um, sanctified as we speak, right? We're, we're, we're getting, the dross is getting smoothed off the top. Um, things like bizarre hair, hair colors, bizarre haircuts, body piercings, tattoos, um, really peculiar art. And that, that's a whole other subject, you know, what's on your walls, what's hanging on your rear view. Um, Cause a lot of that stuff can actually be demonic, can be like portals. Yeah. But I'm for I'm for, firmly uh, convinced that tattoos can be portals, and that's a whole other conversation. But um, you know, almost like a welcome sign <laughs> to the demonic, which uh, is no bueno, <clears throat> not recommended. Um, so anyway, to have discernment for these things, are you picking up on clues that things are going on? Um, and so then. It gets to, I think, the question of, uh, is it covert or, or overt? You know, you, there's, I think most of the time when you're around people of that sort, if they're not consistently in your lives, if they're not looking for help, if they're not, uh, if you're not engaged with them, in, in a manner that could either re, be really promising in terms of leading to liberation for that person or assisting you in avoiding attack or avoiding calamity. Um, I think, and, and this could be pretty controversial and, and frankly, I, I, could, I could see myself being swayed depending on the situation, but um, discretion may be the better part of valor there. And, um, and I'm, re I'm reminded of the parable of the windswept house where the person was 
purged of demon. The house was swept clean. And this was one of Jesus' parables. And and the demon was wandering through dry places and decided <laughs> it wanted to go back home. And it came back with seven demons worse than it. And they took up residence. And that person was worse off than before. I don't, I don't think Jesus told us that because it's a, a curious and amusing parable. I think it's real. I think it's applicable. And I, I know uh, of a particular heartbreaking situation where um, a dear friend of mine, very solid spiritual warrior, um, got involved with this poor young woman who'd been uh, kidnapped and basically was a sex slave. And, um, and they physically saved her over and over and over. But the demonic infusing in her was so great, they couldn't they, they couldn't break it, break her out of it. And, and I think that was a, an eye-opening example of um, as heartbreaking as that is, it, it, it may be the better for that person to be less afflicted than they might be yeah. if you clean it up and then they, and then it's worse than before. Mm -hmm. So that can, only be <clears throat> that can only be determined by the leading of the Holy Spirit though, right? That yeah, discernment. exactly. Exactly. And, and you've, oh. You know, I, I don't know what you guys think of that little vignette I put into the spiritual warfare toolkit, but there's a there's a multi multi page <laughs> situation that I tried to outline in there. Yeah. And one, one of the points yep. I, I made in that little novella <laughs> was they were the the heroines of that story were very plugged in to the Holy Spirit, very discerning, but but continually through that engagement they were plugged into the Holy Spirit, they were, they were seeking discernment and they were, um, they were attuned through the Holy Spirit. Festus, that's a fantastic point. Attuned through the Holy Spirit into discernment so that they had effectively otherworldly perception of, of what was going on. Um, and, and that sort of thing happens. Um, so anyway, um, back to what I was saying. So, so let's say it is an engagement. Let's, let's say this is, you know, in that situation, it was the teenage child of a woman who was saved and the daughter had gone through struggles and no father in the family. And, you know, and it was appropriate for there to be, I'll call it kinetic engagement, but it's, it's on the spiritual plane. Right. Um, so at that point, then it's sort of, what are the practical elements of how you go about that you know first of all um you you speak in your authority that you have because you're saved and because of who saved you um and what i mean by that is you know if, if you want to bind the demons <laughs> that is your purview because you are an adopted son you know you're you're going to receive a crown of glory, you know, and, and, and this whole temporal thing where we're on the earth and the earth's going around and all that, you know, there's a real mystery in scripture where Paul uses the present tense multiple times when he, when he talks about us being seated uh, on thrones with crowns of glory, you know, he, he uses a present tense. So there's this, this uh, eye opening, um, uh, doctrine of, of right now, but not yet. And so you have to move in that right now part of your salvation where you're humble, you know, it's not you, you know, it's not, not your own strength. It's God's through his son, Jesus and the Holy spirit, but you speak authority, you know, you're on the field and you call out the demons, you bind them, you dispatch them, you do what you want to do in perfect harmony with God's will. So that to me, that's the first big point is you've got authority. You understand that you do. And in keeping with his will, you speak truth to power and you're not praying for him to do it. He's expecting you to do it. You speak to the demons, you call them out, you shut them up, you calm them down. So I think that's the first really big point. 
I think the second point is, and I think this sums up a lot of a lot of what I'm going to say is, do it the way they did it in the New Testament. You know, there, and and gentlemen, I'll ask you guys this as I take a sip of water. Was there anything in that spiritual authority section or the spiritual warfare toolkit that was not consistent with Scripture? Hmm. I would have to think on that one. I, okay. I think right off, uh, I've been through it twice um, so far. Uh, first time reading, second time with some notes. And uh, nothing right off jumps out at me. Fastest, you, what, what do you think? I, I have to agree with what you said. I mean, with that specific question in mind, I would go back and, and reread it, but I I don't think so. I don't think there's anything non-scriptural or non-biblical about what you presented there. Okay. I'll, uh, and I appreciate, I kind of put you on the spot and that's no, an important right. question. So I appreciate your, your earnestness in answering it. I will tell you, you know, as I wrote it, what I had in mind was, I mean, first of all, my walk with Russ Dizdar and and his yeah. expertise, um, but also the, the various stories, in particular, the, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then the book of Acts, um, and those instances where, you know, Jesus called a demon out, Jesus, you know, addressed the, the Gadarene demoniac, um, casting out demons, um, Paul casting out the demons of the gal who is following them around saying, you know, these are the servants of the living God. And he finally had enough after three days and whipped around and cast the demons out. And then she couldn't, couldn't foretell the future anymore. Um, th those are the different engagements that to my knowledge, put it this way, to my knowledge, there's nothing in here that's not consistent with those engagements. And so they're, they're really drawing from these different, engagements of you know jesus or paul or others um with the demonic but so back to the practical you speak your authority you're consistent you're plugged into the holy spirit for discernment and his will um you what you want to do is you want to resolve the situation so you you want to do things such as and i'm not limiting what you do but these are examples yeah. You want to bind the spirit because the spirit is active. It's loose. It's moving to whatever degree it's, it's got authority or uh, declared authority uh, in this person, on this person, near this person, because of things like addictions, uh, you know, demonic activity, worship, satanic stuff, music. I mean, all this stuff create openings, portals. And so, um, you, you want to do things such as bind the spirits. You want to break off their authority. You want to, um, they also will derive pro, uh, declared authority and let's say possession or, or a right to, to be active through, um, through sinful behaviors, like I just referenced. So you want to cover all those activities and those wrong uh, decisions, those things with the blood of Jesus. Um, you want to speak constantly in the name of Jesus or by the blood of the lamb. Okay. Cause that's where you, you don't have any authority. We're, we're all like the sons of Sceva on our own, but we know as adopted children of the living God that in the name of Jesus, you're a little Jesus. What do you think Christian, you know, means? You're a little Christ. You're yeah. like Christ. And so speak like Christ and in his power, in the name of Jesus, bind the demons, call them out by name. And when I say call them out by name, remember with the demonic, uh, the gathering demoniac, he, he said, what is your name? I, I think it's very powerful. In fact, I've experienced this in my life with things like addiction and conflict to understand the when i say name the name might be tobacco addiction 
the name might be spirit of pornography, or it may be a spirit of um, rebellion against parents, or maybe a spirit of violence. You know, so you might know not know some archaic name of this demon from 3,000 years ago, but it, it's a spirit of addiction, violence, drug addiction, pornography, whatever. And so you can call it out by name that way. Um, break off its authority. You cover any and all sins surrounding transgressions around the place, the person. Uh, cover it with the blood of Jesus. And then, you know, whatever. Well, well, I'll get to that in a second. But And then ultimately, you want to bring liberation. So you cast that filthy vermin demon out. I like to use the Greek ekbalo because it just it feels right. <laughs> it's kind of like a good yeah. a good uh, firearm in your hands, you know, it just fits for me. But, um, you know, you don't, you don't have to use the Greek. You can just say, get out, get out in Jesus' name. Be forceful. Be speak with confidence and conviction and bring the lightning down on these filthy vermin. And then... As you've done this, um, it, it, it is just an ideal moment to bring salvation through the gospel. And so that person, if you brought liberation to that person, uh, unless they are completely wrong-minded, share the gospel and get the Holy Spirit empowered in them wow. that creates the ultimate defense. Pastor, did you have a question? Yeah, but I forgot it after I was listening as he continued on. <laughs> One thing you were talking about there, you know, you're going through this list of discernment, covert, overt, battle, etc. Um, can you address um, uh, maybe a, a little bit more depth of how people can transition from more from a follower to a, a leader or because uh, we're all kind of conditioned through our lives to be mm -hmm. followers, do what we're told, stay within the lines, etc. And what you're saying here um, and what we're reading in the Bible says, no, we're not supposed to do that, but it's very difficult to overcome. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's, that's a lovely point. And, and listen, I'm eight, nine years ago, I was Gideon down in the wine press threshing wheat, you know, so so I speak as someone who has done things that if you had asked me eight or nine years ago, are you going to be doing those things? I'd say, heck no, I'm not going to be doing those things. So I speak as someone who has transitioned from being, you know, a sheep to a sheep dog of sorts. Um, this, this, this hour that we're coming into this storm that is blowing in to this nation to this world this this uh this season of affliction is here and you don't need me to tell you that of course right um and yes you you listen you can be saved and be a follower of jesus and just never break out and and yes, you, you can have salvation and not be um, a spiritual warrior. Having said that, um, these, these truths that we're discussing this afternoon, they're real. This, this war and this battlefield that, that is all around us, the war raging all around us is real. And God needs his people some portion of his people to stand up to to stand for the good and the right to be salt and light and to 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 challenge the evil in the world and uh you know I, I, one of the things i've been most moved by in recent weeks is the scripture of daniel eleven thirty two, where he writes but they that do know their god shall be strong and do exploits so if you know your God, he's the, he's the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Sabaoth. I used to make the mistake, gentlemen, thinking that meant he was the Lord of the heavenly hosts, the Lord of the angel armies. And that's not untrue, but it's too limiting. 
He's also the Lord of the earthly hosts, the human hosts, yeah. the adopted son and daughter hosts. And that, if you're listening to that, I suspect there's a good chance that's you. And so if you're a member of his adopted children host, his army, then you need to seriously consider whether a calling on your life from God is to stand up, to be strong, to to speak truth to power, and to be um, a, a force for liberty for those who are afflicted, those who are depressed, those who are downtrodden, who are basically captured humans who are suffering from addiction and wrong worship and all these things. And, you know, not only speak, frankly, into it with your spiritual authority to, to cast out the filthy vermin, but to bring the gospel. And, and I hope I never forget the importance of, of mentioning that, you know, while you're attuned to the spiritual warfare, that there, there is nothing more powerful than bringing the gospel to save souls and to build, to, to participate. We, we have this astounding honor. We get to participate. Not that he couldn't do it without us, but we get to participate in God rounding out his eternal family with his adopted children by bringing the gospel to, to new people. So taking what you just said, I'm going to turn it around a little bit. Okay. Can, can, we, can people really be a true remnant and make it to the, the last day, um, not taking the mark of the beast, et cetera, without being a true warrior or ship, sheepdog? I... <laughs> You know, it's going to take a lot of, of determination, a lot of faith, uh, a lot of guts, for lack of a better word, to stay out of the B system as we're because we're getting sucked into it now. The bowl yeah. is swirling right now. Yeah. Can we really make it through to the final day? without really being a sheepdog or a warrior, whether we admit it to ourselves or not, or want to be or not, I don't know. Yeah. Well, three things, three things come to mind on that, Festus. First is God can accomplish all that he will, and he, he doesn't rely on anything, anyone. So if he, if he desires to preserve someone who's, and this sort of segues into my second point, who, whose calling is other than that of a fearless sheepdog, he can do what he wants, right? And and we are all, we all sort of start as sheep, so there's that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, um, you know, my, my second point would be that I just alluded to is we all have different callings. You know, we all have, um, make up different parts of the body of Christ, as it were. And, I can easily foresee how someone could be steadfast in encouraging others or comforting others or um, being supportive to others and, and like in an army and, and not be a frontline warrior, but bring a really beautiful, lovely uh, provision of, of some variety to others who are. So I, I can see that, you know, I can see how not, not everybody's supposed to be a blacksmith, right? We'd have too much iron and not enough, uh, yeah. not enough bread and stew at the end of the day. So I do think there is that, but then, you know, I think finally there's, there's different, there's different ways to uh, demonstrate strength. And I think maybe it's that strength in knowing who you were redeemed by, that he's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he, he will never leave us or forsake us. And, and so whatever you're called to be strong in or at, um, I think that might be closer to that universal um, calling, Festus, is we're all going to have to be strong in those, in those ways that God 
created us to be strong. Yeah. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? It does. It yes. does. It does. Yeah. yeah. Gentlemen, it, we are we are at 52 minutes and could probably go for hours <laughs> more again. Uh, it's been awesome. Um, but I'll go fastest and then uh, John with uh, any final comments on video two in our series. Festus, any final thoughts? No, I think what he was just uh, saying is, is just a good place to end and, and think about, continue to think about. Yeah. Uh, actually, the Nehemiah Strong book, uh, that's one of the things I find myself doing is uh, reading a little bit, laying it down, thinking, going back and reading again to ensure that what I understood the first read was your intent. You know, and then taking notes and then uh, some of the folks who have your book that are part of Hope for Survival the, the conversations with me is uh, um, is the application, you know, throughout it. Because for a lot of folks, uh, the depth of Nehemiah Strong, um, it is beyond surface conversation, you know, it's... Um, so I learned this. I learned this at school today, and now I'm at home. And how am I going to apply it? We'll go back and read it again, you know, mm. or, or talk to someone else, or in this case, talk to John, and he'll give you the straight up answer. You know, John. Final comments. You know, Bravo. I, can, I would just say, first of all, if you made it this long in in our video today, then then bully for you, and thank you for uh, for for <laughs> listening to our our little. Uh, iron sharpening session and um and god really laid it on my heart here just now to to really exhort you to start with seeking his face first and and the scripture that's coming to mind for me is psalm 91 if if you're not familiar with psalm 91 i really challenge you i exhort you to go read psalm 91 nice and slow read it in a good translation, which for me is the King James, and really consider the first verse, which says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The whole rest of the psalm is only available to those who dwell in his secret place, which is to say, those with a close walk with him. If you want the astounding, towering promises of Psalm 91, he wants to give them to you, but it's going to require you to seek his face earnestly and with real conviction. And so I, I, I exhort you to go read Psalm 91, pray on it, ask God for a closer, deeper walk from, from you to him. And, um, and I know that, that you'll be blessed if you do. Outstanding. Gentlemen, thank you both for um, your time and um, your your offerings here today. Look forward to next week for um, uh, video three. Um, we'll get recorded and out. And um, anyone that has any questions for uh, John or um, Festus or myself, you can reach out. And um, John's information is just before this video and just after it. And uh, if it's for Festus or myself, you can uh, reach out to Hope for Survival um, and either to us or we can relay it through to John. And uh, this has been an absolute blessing to um, uh, how our paths crossed and the fact of uh, where the journey is taking us. So until uh, next week. Um, God bless and uh, stay safe and good luck uh, in the next 24 hours, John, with uh, what you have coming up. So until um, next time, Thank you. be blessed, stay safe. And bravo Echo out. This is John Dislin. Thank you for your time today. We hope this message has been a blessing to you. Uh, regarding Nehemiah Strong, if, if this message resonates with you, if you'd like to learn more, if you'd really like to get equipped and encouraged, for these days ahead, uh, I encourage you to go to my website, johndislin.com. That's D-Y-S-L-I-N, johndislin.com. And there you can learn all about uh, Nehemiah Strong, uh, my big 
reference guide for standing, occupying, and overcoming in this season of trial. Uh, it's 480 pages, 48 supplements and exhibits, and just chock full of um, practical applications, both in spiritual as well as practical for us to um, to be victors and not victims in this in this season. So I encourage you to go to johndislin.com and be sure to use the discount code HFS1 to uh, save 10% on anything you might uh, decide to purchase. Thank you in advance for your interest. Uh, God bless you and keep you Psalm 91 blessings over you and your family. And uh, look forward to um, speaking with you all again soon. Take care. Thank you.